much. Um, I am going to hand straight over to our wonderful moderator for the evening, um, who's going to introduce you to our wonderful speakers for the evening. So over to you, Mike. Uh, thanks very much, um, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a cold Friday evening, and hello to uh, anyone who is watching online from the comfort of your warm home as well. Um, as you can see, we have one empty chair, so at the moment we're one panellist down and hoping that, that Kerry Brown hasn't decided that he's going to watch from the comfort of his warm sofa as well, but we're going we're to kick off and hopefully he is uh, going to be joining us. Let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm Chris Morris. I was a foreign correspondent for the BBC for about 25 years. Um, I left the BBC last year before they started telling sports presenters they weren't allowed to have opinions. And um, I now uh, broadcast and write on a freelance basis and uh, occasionally moderate panels such as this. So um, I don't think I need to say a huge amount by way of introduction. Uh, what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, our panellists to make some opening remarks. We'll have a bit of chat and, of course, we'll take questions uh, from the floor. And if you have any questions, if you're watching online, please do put them in the chat. And uh, I'm promised that somebody will read them out in the room so we can take those questions as well. Um, we all know where we are. We're, you know, it's just a year, just over a year on now from Russia's uh, reinvasion of Ukraine. There's all sorts of topics we could discuss, but what we're going to try to do is look at the role of Vladimir Putin, uh, look at support for the war, the extensive support for the war within Russia, but also, uh, if our China expert arrives, uh, support from uh, without external support, particularly from China, Russia's most important ally. So I'm hoping that Kerry Brown turns up. If not, we're going to talk more exclusively about Russia and Vladimir Putin itself. So let me just um, introduce the two panellists who are with me. Jade McGlynn, uh, on the far side, is an academic researcher and author, focusing a lot at the moment, obviously, on the war in Ukraine. But uh, you've also done a lot of work on propaganda and the politics of memory. Underneath my laptop here, Jade's new book, Russia's War. I'm not her agent, but uh, it's published next week. It's, it's literally hot off the press. Uh, so um, I'm sure she'll have a lot of interesting set things to say about this, not least because, of course, we called this session Putin's War. The book is called Russia's War. That's one of the, the things uh, we want to discuss. And then next to me, uh, Irina Borogan is a Russian investigative journalist, co-founder of the website agentura.ru, uh, also co-wrote The Compatriots, uh, a book about Russian emigres, uh, Russian exiles, and I guess Russia's treatment of them by spies, secret services, and so forth. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask both of them to speak for just a few minutes to, to begin with. Maybe, Jade, we can start with you. Um, as I said, your book's called Russia's War, uh, and your argument appears to be that, that, that Putin is sort of... Uh, he's a symptom rather than the cause of the war, and he was responding to, to something that was already there. Yes, in the sense of the, the longer war, but I suppose if I can cycle back to the first part of, of the question, um, I think sometimes the Putin's war, Russia's war dichotomy can be quite unhelpful because it gives this idea that either everybody in, in Russia is um, actually secretly really against the war, um, but they just don't want to say, or on the other hand, that um, you know everybody um, is some sort of crazy Z head um, that, that that just can't that just can't wait to to go to Ukraine and commit war crimes. And as always, the situation is is far more nuanced. And I think most of the population would really fall. Well, I'd rather talk about attitudes than, than people. People are complex. But most of the attitudes, um, I think, are probably better understood as as, as somewhere. Um, in a more, much more nuanced position, so where you have people who are apathetic because perhaps they don't like the war, but they just think, well, what am I going to do about it? And political Putin has been, um, and, and the Kremlin has been great at engendering political apathy in Russia um, over, over the last sort of 23 years. Or you have people who say, well, my country right or wrong, since we've started the war, let's finish it. Um, and they just sort of use that loyal, so it's neutral loyals we could call, I, I think I call them. Um, and then you have the group of people who, who basically approve of the war, but I think support, particularly the word support in English, is a little bit too strong because it gives these ideas of almost you know, football fans really cheering for something. And actually, really, what we're talking about often is people acquiescing to something. And, and one of the things that I try to look at in the book is why people acquiesce to it. So there are different, of course, there are a lot of different reasons. 
the corrosive nature of fear, propaganda to a certain extent, but also some of the underlying attitudes and frames for, for understanding the world that, that meant people tuned on. But one of the things I hope I don't do is assume too much of a moralistic stance, because I think the important thing is to try to have that empathy to understand you know, Russia, there's nothing specific or, or pathological about Russians. They're not the first people to support um, a horrific and stupid war, and they won't be the last. So it's worth trying to understand understand why, but but also to to give Russians agency in, in their own decisions. Can I just briefly ask you all to, if you could speak loudly into your microphones, that would be much appreciated. Sorry. Yeah, just 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 hold it more like this than, than like this. I think they're quite di they're quite they're quite directional. Um, uh, Irina, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but any brief comment on what Jade has said before I'm, I'm, I introduce Kerry? Uh, I agree. I agree with her completely because uh, I don't feel that we have the uh, active, full support of the war in Ukraine right now because we, can't see, we don't see people marching uh, across the street with pro-war pro -war signs and placards. We don't see this. It, it never happened. Of course, we have some events organized by the authorities, by, by the United Russia Party, when, put, put, when people are coming in thousands to support his, their president, but it's, they don't do it by, by their own. Okay, we're, we're going to come back and ask you a bit more about, about the mood in Russia in a minute, but let me introduce, uh, better late than never, uh, <laughs> Kerry Brown, <laughs> Professor of Chinese Studies at, at King's College in London, former diplomat in Beijing, uh, and author of Xi, a study in power, um, Kerry, in the introduction, I said, obviously, we're talking about two separate but linked things, attitudes towards the war internally, but I guess Russia's most important external partner, friend, I don't know which word you use, is China. And I, I wonder if you could just speak for a couple of minutes on what you think the view from Beijing is on Putin himself and on Russia and its, and its war in Ukraine. Sure, yeah, thanks, thanks. Is this okay? Can you hear? Yeah, this okay. Um, yeah, so China uh, wants to sit on the fence, basically, but the fence is um, sort of very kind of unstable, and I think it's probably not super happy with what Putin has done, um, but it's not an ally of NATO, no way. So it kind of doesn't really want either side to win or either side to lose. Um, China isn't a natural ally of Russia. I mean, it wants a neighbourly... Uh, relationship because they share this massive border. Historically, uh, they've not been natural allies at all. Um, they've had a kind of very up and down relationship. But in the last uh, 20 years under Putin, he's supplied to China um, stability. Uh, under Yeltsin, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think uh, China did not enjoy that period at all. Uh, it felt that everything that the USSR did when it collapsed is a textbook of what China should, shouldn't do. It thinks that, uh, you know, Russia became uh, a sort of beholden to the West and started to sort of do things not in its interest. And today it's keen to have um, a Russia which is basically the bad boy and gets all the flack. Because I think without the awful invasion by Ukraine of Russia, um, China would really be getting it now. I mean, it's getting it anyway, but it would be really getting it now. And Russia has been great at just sort of taking everyone's animosity and going nuts at this, you know, sort of pain in the backside. And sort of China can sort of sit there and be a bit passive. Um, finally, I mean, what does China want? Um, as I said, it wants, um, a, it wants a draw. Uh, it doesn't want a victory for NATO. No way. I mean, it doesn't want, it's, it's had enough of moralizing sort of Westerners kind of leaping up and down saying how great their systems are. So it's, it's not keen on, I'm not, that's not my view, that's China's view, by the way, just to not trigger anyone here. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't want Russia to win because it just knows that that's going to create a, a lot of resentment and, and, you know, that would be a disaster too. Um, but I think it also should be listened to in as much as it does understand a victory over Russia, whatever that means. Um, would create resentments that go way beyond Putin. I mean, Putin is a here today and one day gone leader. But obviously, uh, China understands resentment. It <laughs> has our modern history built on resentment. And so it does understand that if you've got a resentful Russian polity, 
this is not just about Putin. It's going to be about, you know, offended nationalism. And that's much, much sort of bigger problem. So that's what China wants. Um, does it have the influence to get it? Well, we can discuss that later. But uh, that's, it, it wants a draw. And, and you've sort of talked about the politics. What about the, the economics? I mean, there's been a lot of talk, well, uh, you know, Russia may not be selling so much gas to Europe anymore. It can just send it the other way. But you do need pipelines in place, don't you, for that sort of thing. It's not an immediate switch. Does China see that it may have economic leverage over Russia because it will be more dependent on it as a market? Yeah, I mean, China is uh, not an equal partner. I mean, China's economy is six times the size of the Russian economy. So China does not see itself in the same club as Russia. I mean, it's also, despite economic problems, it's only got 2% inflation. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's got a potential 5 to 6% growth rate this year. The energy um, is interesting. I mean, it has been an opportunity for China, but China's mostly been using fossil fuels lately. It hasn't really um, kind of, I think it's looked at the dependence of the West on Chinese, uh, on Russia's energy, and it's kind of thought, we're definitely not gonna duplicate that. But it's been opportunistic, and so far the opportunities have been all right. But just finally, I mean, it definitely doesn't want Russia to tank the, you know, the global economy. I mean, it doesn't want that. It does not want this war to sort of drag down, you know, the Western economies. That's not what it wants to. It just wants stalemate. Uh, Irina, um, I might be interested to hear what you would say, you know, people in Russia feel about potential support or otherwise from China, but more generally, the mood in Russia a, a year on from February 24th, um, you wrote a recent article in, in Foreign Affairs where you talked about not quite total war. The fact that Putin sort of promised to go for broke, but it's not quite been full mobilisation. It's not quite been full nationalisation of a war economy. It's not been quite total war in that sense. What, what, what does that do to the mood in the country? Yes, right. And that's all because uh, Putin now are ready for, he's ready for, the long, for a long war. And a few people, including him, expected that this war uh, would last for a year and would last for a long. And now, and you know, that Putin it was, it was started... three days to begin with, wasn't it? But... Yeah. And it started as a short special military operation with a goal to take over Ki Kiev, over through Zelensky, and appoint Putin's president. But uh, we all know that this plan failed and uh, Putin is not going to stop, and there is no end in sight. And I want to say that uh, two big mistakes uh, were made about the situation by journalists and analysts at the beginning of the war and later. Uh, the first, uh, that the Russian economy will be destroyed by the Western sanctions and by, and by the war. And the second, uh, that the Russian military resources especially missiles, will be exhausted uh, by the winter. It, it, none of this happened. And uh, now we all, uh, we all are trying to adjust ourselves to the new reality, and the Russians are doing the same. Those Russians who were enthusiastic about the denazification of Ukraine uh, now are asking themselves a question, when will that end? And many of them depressed and try to distance themselves from the war and uh, they try to live their everyday life, ignoring the tragedy completely. Uh, we also see a lack of reaction to the war from the upper level of society, including the elite and the upper middle class. Uh, these people, they lost a lot because they lost their, not only their holidays, fancy holidays in Italy, but they also lost a lot of assets. They lost their villas, they lost their apartments in Europe, they lost their, lots, their fancy lifestyle. And they still, they still remain silent because of fear. Um, the other part of society, which is also very important, the independent-minded part of Russian society, who still stay, people who still stay in Russia, uh, they are living in constant fear of punishment for their views and for, for this, and for what they did in the past. Because many of them, were, I, I'm talking about people who are, who are living in big cities and in Moscow, 
a lot of them, many of them were involved into cultural, uh, into the cultural relationship with the West. They worked for, uh, they cooperated with uh, Western NGOs, they cooperated with cultural institutions like university and museum, and they all live in a constant fear. Uh, the war prompted a large wave of immigration, and um, uh, the, first, uh, the first people who left Russia were uh, young professionals, uh, opposition politicians, activists, journalists like me. I, 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 didn't, I, do, I did it before. Uh, and, uh, and also our political people like popular YouTubers, Instagrammers, and even TikTokers. They all left Russia immediately after 24th of December. Uh, the other wave of immigration we saw in, uh, after, in September when Putin started mobilization and a lot, thousands of men uh, under 55 left the country, including some members of my family. And to be honest, in my family, only my father and my partner's father stay in Russia, and all other men, they just live, uh, they, st they are living abroad. And uh, by some estimates, the number of people who left the country could reach one million. And uh, uh, the most of them are not going back soon, uh, because the security services and prosecutors, they are busy uh, searching, uh, searching for people who just disagree with the Kremlin. And I can give you one example. This is a terrible example. It happens last week. A 12-year-old girl uh, were, sent for, uh, were sent to a special orphanage because she drew an anti-war picture at school. And her father was put under house arrest because he posted some anti-war stuff on his social media. So that's, that's constant fear and people living on, on the feeling of fear everyday lives. That's a, you, you should not be uh, a political activist or, or I don't know, some, somebody important to feel this fear. You can be just average average person. And uh, what we see, this is a, st a Stalinization of the country. But I want to put some, I want to, I want to bring some optimism in the audience because it's not it's not bad, all all not all is bad about Russians. So uh, we, I wanted to say that there are millions of Russians in Russia who are against the war, and we know that because the Russian journalists and political activists in exile have have audience in mil of millions on their YouTube channels and uh, on their websites and Telegram channels. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, Jay, would you generally agree with that analysis? I wonder how, how, I know it's hard to say, but how strong is Putin's position, given that the war sadly looks like it's going to be going on for much longer than anyone expected? I don't think that Putin's position necessarily depends on public support anyway, because of the way that the, the regime and the political nature has has developed. I, I broadly, I, I do agree with Irina's points, and I think that... Um, you know, likewise for many of, of, of my friends, I mean, a lot of them had already left, to be honest, before even this uh, full-scale invasion took place. But um, it's a pretty terrifying time um, if you are somebody who's involved, not even necessarily in politics, but also in, in civil society. Th that said, of course, there are also a lot of people who it's not necessarily that they support the means of the war, but they might support the ends of them if we understand the end to be the political subjugation of Ukraine. And I think um, perhaps sometimes more attention is, is understandable why, because it's horrible what, um, what um, some of the more Western oriented or even just ordinary people um, who just like having rights quite reasonably um, have to face. But I think it's also interesting to, to pay attention to those other parts of society. So for example, a lot of criticism of the war right now is taking place among um, not just some of the more egregious ultra patriots that we hear about, such as um, Prigozhin or, or uh, the head of Wagner Group or Strelkov, who, who originally commanded, well, it's pretty responsible for the 2014 invasion. Um, but also among different kind of volunteer groups, you know, young, younger politicians, um, such as uh, there's one called Roman Yuneman, for example, and he runs a sort of organization. They deliver blankets to Mariupol, and they're not supportive of the war, but they're very much my country, right or wrong. And I think it's interesting to see to what extent those types of movements are going to resonate as opposed to, because there's already quite a nasty discourse about some of the people who've left, 
and this idea that, okay, well, these people, they weren't for the war, but they stayed. And a lot of those people do tend to be quite ethno-nationalist in a way that it's not fair to perhaps say that Putin is because his nationalism's always been so imperial that he can't really engage. And also, I mean, for what it's worth, I don't think that he genuinely is an ethno-nationalist. He's more of traditional Soviet, great Russian chauvinist in Lenin's terms, I suppose. Um, but yes, I, I'll leave it there. And Kerry, I was interested in, in the way you described China's response to Putin as, you know, I, I guess they do think that they, they play the long game all the time, right? But it's a, it's a bit different than sort of, you know, we can wait out Donald Trump because he's going to have four years, eight at most. Uh, Putin doesn't recognise term limits. That's, that's one thing. It's a longer term thing to think about. But, but how much does China view Russia through the le lens of, of, of it being Putin's Russia? Uh, and how much through Russia, a large neighbour with which we have to do business and compete? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the um, memory of the large neighbour that they have to deal with, whether they like or not, is, is a big one. I mean, uh, the influence of the Soviet Union over the People's Republic of China from the beginning was quite considerable, but they were always arguing, you know, and had a massive bust up at the end of the 50s and war in 1969. So. It's not an easy relationship, but in the last 25 years, it's been harmonious enough because they're realists. They see themselves as realists. I mean, uh, they're opportunist. China is an opportunist, I think, and presumably Russia is, I guess. It sees itself as a realist. Um, but I guess that China is worried by a Putin that's caught in a corner and does things which are dangerous. Uh, it has spoken out a few times about nuclear use of tactical nuclear weapons, which it obviously worries about because it's got a non-first use policy. It's also um, produced this peace plan in the last couple of weeks, which is, I mean, it's not what's in the peace plan. I mean, it's that it did it, um, which is kind of interesting. And it's been quite promoting this peace plan. Um, Will China uh, use unique leverage on Russia? I mean, if it could have, it would. I mean, if it wanted to, it would have done that. It would have done that very early, but it hasn't. So all these people going bang on about, you know, China, the kind of great, you know, uh, powerful country that's going to sort of remodel the world. Well, I mean, on an issue that really kind of does matter to it, it hasn't. It's been very passive. So I think that's been quite revealing. Um, for Putin, um, China is pessimistic almost in everywhere it looks in some ways. And it always assumes that if it's not this one, it's going to be someone worse. So, I mean, you know, that's probably where it's operating. This idea of Putin and Xi Jinping being big sort of man friends, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, are they really normal functioning human beings? I mean, can total psychopaths or sociopaths be big friends with each other? I mean, I guess they know what they're dealing with. But I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's apparent to me, I mean, I've only been to Moscow a couple of times. Obviously, I've been to China loads of times. And I kind of find it very interesting that once you leave the elite level, you know, Xi Jinping and Putin being pals, I don't think it's a very close relationship. It's not a relationship driven by a sort of emotional warmth, and I think that's the critical thing. Well, I like the, the phrase man friends. It, it, how, how important is that from, if you like, in Putin's propaganda universe, the idea that he's got this sort of close personal tie with President Xi? Is that something which is promoted a lot? Uh, they do, they do, especially, especially for the last year, because, I mean, they don't have a lot of friends abroad and the Russian propaganda promoted China a lot but I mean the problem is that Russians they like China state but they don't like Chinese they don't like Chinese culture they don't believe them they're very suspicious of them and, and it's funny but the Russian security services they hate Chinese and they as they many times they were they created an obstacle in cooperation in terms of, in terms of, of intelligence, as in the security services and in the initiative telecommunications everywhere. So it's very complicated. Of course, Putin have to, has to rely on China, but I mean, even his, I saw, uh, once I saw a forum uh, where Chinese and Russian and Russian uh, officials gathered together. 
and it was so, so strange. Chinese, it, 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 it's supposed to be a friendly gathering, but Chinese state on the one side, Russian state on the other side. Chinese uh, uh, feel themselves very, very restricted. Uh, Russians feel great, and they, because it was in Moscow, Russians did not, I mean, they didn't demonstrate their generosity or friendliness. It was absolutely different crowd of people. So I think on the level, uh, on the level of officials, on the level of, at the level of officials, at the level of, uh, of security services, of ministries, there are not a lot of, a lot of trust between these people. No. I just, um, just on that. Uh, You're on, I think. Yeah, just, just on that uh, story. Um, uh, when I lived in China in 1995, I lived in an area called Inner Mongolia. I lived there for um, a year. You're not on. Obviously, the Russian and Chinese secret services are trying to silence me. I won't have this. No, I, I lived in a, um, an area called Inner Mongolia, which was, uh, you know, next to Mongolian, obviously, had quite historically quite big links with Russia. And I remember I was one of the very few foreigners living there, European-looking foreigners, and I remember... You had just, any time you appeared on the street, you get a million people coming and asking you, where are you from, you know, what do you do, how much do you earn a month, what are you doing here, where did it go wrong, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, the one thing that you would do to get rid of people is say you were Russian. <laughs> and then they'd all flee. They'd all completely flee. I was told by someone, look, if they give you hell, just say you're Russian and they'll click the clear off. So I think that's why today, when I hear this language about the big friendship, I sort of think, well, really? I mean, I, no, no. My experience is, is exactly as you say, that there's deep suspicion, with good reason. I mean, there's really historic antagonisms. And I, this is not an enduring relationship. It's not a natural alliance. It's convenience. And that will, will run out when the convenience runs out. That's really interesting. Um, I want a question from the floor. I don't know if people have any... I'd try and sort of get them a little bit thematic. Has anyone got any specific questions about the sort of public mood uh, within Russia? Um, yes, I've got a microphone here. Just, I'll, I'll hold it. Just go ahead. Uh, just one question when you were t discussing the mood of the people in Russia. I was curious whether you have analyzed and dissected the difference of, let's say, the older generation that has memories of when it was the USS Savar versus the younger generation that are used to their travel, used to having luxury brands uh, available and so on, where there is a different mood. Yes, we're Russian, but we kind of like our lifestyle. We're 28, 43, 35. Okay, hold that thought. I'm, I'm going to do my Jeremy Kyle impression and run around the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the names you and Grant are used to be the old customs and excises intelligence analysts for the ex-Soviet states. I've worked quite a lot in Ukraine, including just before and after the Maidan. And my question is, um, what indicators are used and what lines of communication are there to really gauge the oligarchs and the elites in the West? Are we making potential use of them in gauging elite opinion? And I know the oligarchs are not the Kremlin elite, but I wonder, it, it's the old Lyndon Johnsonism, better to have some of them inside the tent than outside. I'm not sure we're making enough use of that. Thank you. OK, thank you. So one question, I don't know who wants to take it, one question on, I did guess, different generations, and then one on oligarchs. Jay, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so, of course, there's been quite a lot of polling. Now, it's very, very difficult to rely on the polling, and there's lots of caveats about doing polling in in Russia at the moment, but for a long time, even if we look at sort of polling before the 24th February 2022, we do see there's quite a marked difference in attitudes of younger people, if we say that's under 35, to the generation that lived through the Soviet Union. We also see that um, in their attitudes towards the economy. Um, so we see that in their attitudes towards politics, sorry, towards Putin, towards events in Ukraine, but we also see it in their attitudes towards the economy. So. Um, if um, a very high number um, of those who, who chose a view, I think the last survey showed that 80% of, of Russians, uh, uh, with the caveat about polls again, 80% um, of Russians would prefer a more Soviet planned distribution style of um, economy. That number is much lower, it's sort of around 50-50 when you get to the younger generation. So there's a difference. However, the idea, I think the, the memory of 
of the way that the transition happened and the rise of the oligarchy is, is a, in 1990s, the tradi uh, transition to, to capitalism is such a sore memory and a memory that the Kremlin has done a very good job of manipulating and, and, and making even worse and instrumentalizing. As a result of that, I think, you know, there's not necessarily this, this um, there's, there's quite a lot of, there's more Soviet nostalgia among younger generations than one might think, even though, of course, they didn't necessarily experience it, and even though it's much less than, than among older generations. And then just quickly on the point on oligarchs, I would say, well, I don't really understand that there, I know it's a useful term, but are there any oligarchs, really? Because if an oligarch is somebody who has um, power because of their wealth, um, really, it seems the other way around in Russia today. Of course, that was a great description for the 1990s, but in Russia today, you have wealth because you're close to, because you have power, because you're close to power. Um, and, I mean, Irina will talk about this much, much better than I will, but, you know, the, the role in particular of the security services, even in deciding not just who gets jobs, but even who's allowed to resign, um, I think... <laughs> I think it's difficult. I'm not sure we should see this through the prism of, of oligarchs, let alone the, the moral qualms of doing, doing deals with them. Irina, um, different generations? Um... Uh, of course, yeah, younger generation, because they're not so angry, disappointed. They're not so supportive uh, uh, of the war as older generations. That's true. But the, uh, the biggest division is between the big cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Yekaterinburg, and the Russian region, Russian provinces, because the level of life is so, so different. And people, uh, to be honest, if you're living in Moscow and you're older, older 50, you just, and it's very possible you, are, you, have your, uh, you have your holidays abroad every year. But if you live in Russian provinces, even 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 in, your, in your, your in your early twenties, you maybe will never will never go abroad, especially in Europe. So it's 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 social division. So right. And it, was the question was how we can use how the West can use oligarchs? Yeah. Like, but it's also are they an, an accepting doctrine of any point that I think the term oligarchy far too widely become lazy. Um, but whether elites, should we say, still have links with the West, are in any way a guide to top-level opinion or not? So, so it's partly about whether there's almost a, alternative centres of power that maybe we could we could we could maybe, use, and yeah. and I mean, Jade seems to suggest maybe not, but. Um, I can't help notice they were rather slow in sanctioning Abramovich, and I can't help feel there were good reasons. Good reasons, not bad ones. Oh, I don't think they have a huge political uh, political influence. Oligarchs have huge political influence in Russia, and they have a, a lot of political influence over Putin right now. Because it used to be in the early 2000s, because when Putin was um, was not sure about economy, was not sure about uh, what's going on in the country, and he needed. They support and he got oligarch support, except except Khodorkovsky, everybody supported him and no rebel against him. I mean, also it was also Gusinski, but it happens much, much, uh, much earlier. And now I'm I'm I don't know uh, personally and emotionally I'm so angry at these people for the mistakes of the 90s for uh, their their smart people and they're intelligent people and for their they did not appreciate the democracy which was given by Gorbachev and then and then the Yeltsin. They did not support democratic institutions at all. They were always so close to the Kremlin and tried to promote the Kremlin's position and they never supported rarely democratic elections. So and after that uh, they got they got a lot of profit from, from that for the first times, but right now they, I mean, as other as, as other uh, level of society, they live in in a constant fear. And Novichok, uh, this is a word which is very visible for them. Uh, whenever they are here in London or in Rome or in Moscow, it's all the same for them. So I don't know how how the West can use them. I think I think that. Not using them at all and put them all under sanctions will be a good, good example for future generations. Because you, you, if you're 
don't support democracy. If you missed your chance to support democracy, if you support an authoritarian leader and uh, only for profit, that was stupid. And everybody should know that because you had to support institutions that could defend uh, your profit and your assets in future. If you did not, you are losers and you should be punished. Can I, yeah, I, I just want to identify myself with um, Irina's anger and her points, though I would, I would say I agree. I think we should sanction them all. I sometimes don't like the language of sanctions because it has that very hectoring, um, you know, Western sort of lecturing. And I think there's big questions to be asked about why that money's here. You know, it's very, it's, it, we all can have a nice sort of moan about uh, Russian corruption or, or even Ukrainian corruption. But why is all that money in our jurisdictions? Um, I think that's an important question. So really, rather than s seeing this as sanctions, I think we should get all of that money out and get these people out because just in terms of maybe making our own democracies more resilient, it, it, just from a national security standpoint and uh, without even getting into morality, which is always a dark area. <laughs> okay, are there any, any questions for Kerry in particular on, on the relationship between Russia and China? There's a gentleman there. I'm going to do, I'm gonna do my run around, keep, keep myself fit. Yes, sir. Oh, hi. Um, quick question about uh, energy. And uh, it, it, with Russia being sanctioned against energy exports, are, are you aware of uh, energy <clears throat> going to China that can give funds that can uh, be used to, to, to uh, fund the war effort? I mean, do you have any uh, insight on that? Um, thank you. Yes, I've got a question for Kerry. Um, Am I right in thinking that you said that um, if China hadn't used its, the, the leverage it might have with Russia on um, an issue as important as Ukraine, then it was unlikely to use it on anything else? And I just wanted to, if that is what you said, I just wanted to question whether you thought Ukraine was really such an important issue to China. Okay. Take yeah, away. so the um, energy one, I, I mean, um, so China doesn't recognize the sanctions, obviously, um, but then nor does sort of like three quarters of the, the rest of the world. It's, it's a, interesting, the ones that have sanctions and the ones that don't. So energy, uh, I mean, it's also um, not going to violate anything that will impact on its self-interest. Um, so all of these rumors about China offering military assistance to um, Russia, I'm deeply skeptical of because I don't think it's reached a point where China would see that was in its interest. Whether it's doing things covertly, I mean, who knows? I don't know. Because the, the, um, the US said recently, didn't it, that it thought it, that China was on the verge of providing lethal aid. I don't know if yes. that was just a warning shot or um, hard to tell. But to be on the verge of something is not, not you know, to have done it. Um, and I think for China that would, be to, that would be to cross a red line. I would be very surprised if it did it. Um, and if it did it, there would have to be some huge strategic kind of calculation it would have made to justify that because it's got huge domestic problems economic problems and other things so to come to the energy issue yes its priority now uh, is to address those economic issues and make sure it gets whatever five percent growth this year and therefore if it needs to have deeper trading relations with china for energy um which can be kind of uh, sort of confusing enough and, you know, sort of difficult enough to track down, I mean, it probably would do it. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I think it's going to try and sort of make sure it doesn't violate any sanctions and its, its finance entities, I believe, have, have sort of been kind of caught out with this, its banks and things, but um, it's quite good at concealment, so no one really knows what the hell's going on. Um, for the... Um, yeah, I mean, so you, for China, um, I, my point really is that this is a relatively easy thing for China to come out the good, you know, the good player, right? I mean, because you're right. I mean, it's not absolutely central to its strategic interests. It's a big partner for Russia and Ukraine, actually. We forget that, but it had big investments in Ukraine and Ukraine supplied some of its energy and it had a big relationship. So 
you know, it can sit on the wall and it can pr try and be a mediator. In that case where it could probably have done something quite constructive and come out with kudos from, you know, everyone, um, it hasn't done it. It's just done everything it can to get away from the problem and not want any responsibility. So in view of the fact that that would have been a relatively straightforward, I mean, difficult as it is, it would have been relatively straightforward for China to at least come out looking positive. Um, I can't see another case being sort of so relatively straightforward where it would, um, you know, kind of be able to come out the winner. So I just don't think it wants to, it does not want to get involved. It just does not want to commit. Okay, other, other questions on, I mean, rather than me telling you what you're allowed to ask about, any topics you like. Um, if you got, there's a microphone at the back. Do you want to do the gentleman there? And then I will uh, give the microphone to the gentleman here. One back there. And we'll do one here and uh, one here. Thank you. Um, just the issue of sovereignty. I mean, China, you know, generally has sort of beat up the West around lack of respect for sovereignty. And, of course... Uh, Russia used to do the same thing, but for something, re a reason I don't understand, the sovereignty word has sort of vaporized. Okay. Am I right? Or? Okay. Sovereignty. Um, um, slightly off-piste. I'm just curious because we've got a China expert and two Russian experts, but the other country that uh, might be doing a little bit of fence-sitting is India. Uh, I'm just curious to know if there was any opinion. Do we have any India experts? Yeah, well, because I was based there for four years. So I could it is the largest democracy in the world, but it has, an, it certainly has an opinion on what's going on. Thanks. I have a question on the Chinese relationship with the conflict. I wonder how you'd respond to those that think that while China may not have necessarily endorsed the, um, the conflict, their benefit from it in, in some other ways. So, you know, you mentioned the fact that the distribution of votes in the General Assembly is quite skewed. It's not as if everyone in the world and uh, their systems in, you know, endorse the uh, Western policies, particularly of sanctions, right, in the SWIFT. And there are people who say that one of the things that this conflict is doing is, re, is allowing China to use the sanctions, et cetera, to advocate for urgently needed reform in the international architecture, finance architecture. You know, and you, you can see this in the rising importance of the yuan, this uh, regionalization of relationships. And I wonder how you feel about that and to what degree you think those are considerations that are impacting their responses. Thanks. Okay. Um, should, we, should we start with uh, sovereignty? I mean, th th there's various things you could say about it. But, I mean, uh, I guess one of the interesting things is, you know, obviously, Vladimir Putin doesn't recognize Ukraine as a sovereign country, it doesn't recognize it. So where, where does sovereignty fit into this and, and, and how does that impact on public opinion in Russia as well? So I think sovereignty is key. I think it's a really interesting question. And um, I think sovereignty is in the eye of the beholder. And um, when it comes to Putin, you're quite right. He doesn't see Ukraine as a sov sovereign country. I mean, he's, he's written about this in a very detailed and boring essay that should have been edited down, but was not, um, where, it, Essentially, the impression is of Ukraine as a weapon. The idea of Ukrainianness is um, his vision of it is as a weapon, you know, created by the Poles or by the West, by external enemies to, um, to to threaten Russia, to threaten Russian identity, because the particular notion of Russian identity that that, that he has and that he draws on, it's, it's not his own. It's, it's sort of wider. It. it it depends really on, on the on control over Ukraine for, for, for lots of reasons to do with the legacy of Kiev and Rus and, and lots of other points. But um, around sovereignty, I mean, if I were somebody closer to the Kremlin, um, what I would say is that actually this is a war about sovereignty. And, and this is an argument that has had some, that does have some currency um, in the global south in particular, because the argument is that Putin is fighting, that Russia is fighting a war for a different type of international order, one where the one against the unipolarity of America and the West that came after the fall of the Soviet Union and um, against the, the cultural or normative imperialism and colonization um, of, of the West and of the US um, and NATO. So that argument that actually this is 
a war, an anti-imperialist war with the West um, as, as um, the imperialists rather than how we see it as, as Russia, that, that does have some currency in, in some parts of, of the world. I mean, whether or not it has currency because it's in their interests for them to agree with that, that's always a tricky question, but it is worth noting. Irina, thoughts on sovereignty? Sovereignty. Um, because the Soviet Union died not only 30 years ago, a lot of sovereignty does not mean for Russians and for many people outside Russia that um, it should be independent state uh, organized uh, inside uh, current borders. It means for them that there used to be this huge empire, Soviet Union, great empire, and people who, were, who lived in this empire, they, most of them, the majority of them, voted for, for, for this empire state in place. And it happened in, you know, in 1999. The majority of, of uh, Soviet people supported the Soviet Union and they didn't want it, it, it would be disrupted. So, uh, so it, there are a lot of people who are still thinking that uh, this empire should be resurrected in so, to some extent. And, because, and when they, they are talking about sovereignty, that means this, that we, we want a Ukraine back, we want a, some, uh, we want a Moldova back. Uh, we don't, most of them don't want Central Asian country back. Tajikistan is never <laughs> included. <laughs> because they are, they are, I mean, uh, nationalistic in a bad way. And, uh, um, and they, they don't dream now about Balt the Baltic states because they are too far away from them. And so that's what sovereignty means for Russians, uh, for many Russian people and for Putin. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, obviously a lot of people wonder what the war in Ukraine means for China's designs on Taiwan, where obviously, again, sovereignty is an absolutely key issue, isn't it? I mean, it just doesn't recognize it as a separate sovereign entity. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, of people have drawn a parallel between uh, Russia and Ukraine and China and uh, Taiwan. Um, and I suppose uh, China probably would look at what Putin's done and would be aware that, well, war is risky, right? <laughs> and it doesn't go to plan. And um, had there been the three-day, <laughs> you know, success, maybe that would have ratcheted China's desire to do something about Taiwan. But I think it's probably become more risk-averse but I mean, there's, there's, there's sovereignty and there's Chinese sovereignty, right? And they're, they're very different. I mean, Chinese sovereignty is like a religion. And the idea of this entity, you know, China, which cannot give up its historic borders, even though, you know, historically they're not that old. Um, this is anathema, you know, this is just not acceptable. I mean, I suppose it's a bit similar to Russia in a way, but for China, it still has control of Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet, and the idea that there could be an implosion, as in the Soviet Union, where those go, would mean, uh, you know, that would be an existential disaster. So that's why Chinese sovereignty is, is this very emotional issue. On um, India, um, I mean, it's a really important point, actually. I mean, India has been pretty supportive of Russia in a way. I mean, more, maybe more than, than, than China in an odd way. It's just more, um, you know, it's not as vocal. And I guess we always sort of let India off the hook because it's the democracy, as you say. I mean, and that sort of suddenly is the trump card. As human rights issues are really serious, always have been. Uh, its nationalism under Modi is every bit as scary as China. It's just not as good as, not as, good as a bigger an economy. And, um, you know, so I, I sort of think, yeah, India's voice should be here. The only and problem it's, is... It's um, interesting, isn't it? I'm sorry to interrupt. The, mm. I mean, Jade mentioned when talking about sovereignty... I mean, a, a lot of people in India quite like some of the rhetoric coming out of Moscow no. about Western colonialism and, and, and yeah. in, the, in the context of Ukraine. They do. Uh, however yeah. strange it might see to many people in the West. Yeah, I mean, the only problem is if India was part of the dialogue, you'd never stop it speaking. So, you know, that's a sort of, you know, kind of quite vocal diplomacy. On the, the, your question, I mean, I think um, China's mindset now is by... I mean, not, I think it just observes what's happened since 2008 and the economic crisis. And it sees a West which is in decline. That is nothing to do with China. It feels it's, it's not what it wanted, but it sees a West in decline. And its diplomacy is partly to defend itself against screw-ups by those that it once felt weren't so hapless. I mean, so... I think it's really weird because, of course, the mindset in Europe and America often is still 
we have systems which are preferential and better and you know we're more enduring and i mean that's sincere i know but it's with with a china which has completely lost faith in that so this event is part of a series of other events the russia ukraine war and the western response is part of a whole series of events which underline to china the instability and unreliability of the west and sanctions it regards as being um you know kind of purely uh, you know, sort of, they're, they're just opportunism. It's so that NATO can have kind of greater, uh, you know, kind of coherence and all the rest of it. It's because NATO wants to have a second victory in a Cold War, you know, it wants, and that's what it's gearing up to. So, uh, I mean, I'm not endorsing these views, but I think that China's view is very much that um, it's not going to assist NATO in any way to come marching out of a conflict it supported saying it won. It doesn't want to do that. Could I come in just quickly on the, on the India point, um, which is that, of course, I'm sure some of the colonialism rhetoric does resonate uh, without any doubt. But also, I think perhaps more influentially, just Indian business has done pretty well out of the war. You know, there was a lot of, of space that opened up that, that they were able to, to, um, to enter. And of course, they're going to be, like any business elite, they're going to be influential um, on, on politicians. So I think sometimes as well, it's not... It's not the enduring narrative of, um, you know, the emotion of history, though that is very powerful and that's my entire research basis, so I should be careful <laughs> not to destroy my career there. But um, sometimes there's just, you know, your self-interest, like, like you were saying around China. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Um, we've got one gentleman in the white jacket and microphone coming there, and I'll bring this one around here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a journalist and filmmaker, and I've been in and out of Ukraine over the last year, and before that, going back to the Donbass war. Um, I, I'm interested to pick the panel's brain on what you think the West, which I think was becoming quite an obsolete term until the invasion, and that's been galvanized and resuscitated, what you think the West is doing right in regards to Ukraine over the last year, and what you think it's doing wrong. Okay, and sir? And my question is somehow tied to this one. Uh, we know the main actors in what is going on. We know their intentions. We can guess the resources that they can put into this game. And as of now, there are a lot of moving parts. Say like three, four years down the road when these moving parts stop. We can't call this peace. But can you describe where we will be there, like in normal human words? Okay, okay. We need a we need a crystal. Not in normal we, human words. We need sorry, a crystal no, ball. No. Um, let, let's start with um, who wants to go first on what the West is doing right and wrong. Oh. It's a big question. Firstly, I have never understood why Ukraine are not a part of EU because. Uh, a lot of countries uh, became a part of EU, like Bulgaria, like Romania, Ukraine. They always has a lot of people with high education, and the, the population was very, very developed. Why? Why they were not? If, if they were a part of EU, uh, we have been. <laughs> we live. <laughs> we will be living in another world right now. So that was a the major mistake, and of course. Uh, the more recent mistake was uh, that uh, the American intelligence community estimates about building uh, Russian military building up uh, in May 2020 and later uh, was not accepted seriously by EU politicians, by EU diplomats, by by EU uh, by European uh, journalists, and I had a lot of discussions with them back then, and I was just surprised, they just said, ha, 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 that's the same as what happened in 2003, and the weapons of mass destruction, it was not, and there were clear signs of that, and I, don't, I, I understand the nature of anti-Americanism in, in, in Europe, but I can't understand why it should, it, why, why it should create an obstacle in rational thinking and your logic, so that was a major mistake to me. Jade? 
Um, I think that's a really good point, as clearly as somebody um, in the audience also agrees. Um, in terms of what the West's doing right, um, from my point of view, um, I think what they're doing right is that they're arming Ukrainians um, to defend themselves um, and supporting them financially. Um, in terms of, and I think they should con continue to do that, I think the discussions around negotiations are fine. Everybody likes negotiations. Everybody likes peace, right? But peace for who? Peace for us, so we don't have to read about it? Or peace for Ukrainians? Um, because they're two quite different types of peace. And the question isn't about negotiations, what parts of Ukraine can, can we give to Russia? The que because we don't have that right, and I think the, what that would lead to in Ukraine would be difficult. Um, we would miss the current government, I'll put it that way. Um, but also because who's going to get Putin to the negotiating table? How do, how do we get him there? At what point has he shown any... Um, willingness to negotiate in good faith, like sending some sort of nobodies to, to negotiate in, in Istanbul or, or in Minsk, um, which is also a party to the conflict. I don't see any evidence um, of that. So I think we need to get to that bit first before we start saying what part of Ukraine we're going to force Ukraine to give up. Um, in terms of what's been doing wrong, I think just to go to the European Union, it's always a bit awkward as a Brit to, to criticise the European Union, but um, I'm going to anyway. Um, last I think it's week, allowed. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Then let me really get into it. Um, so, first of all, the French. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, I was discussing with, with some French people last, uh, who, who work for EU institutions, and they were saying, well, you know, Ukraine is never going to join, and it's just really, I just worry, are we leading them? you know, along a merry sort of dance and, and they're going to be really disappointed. And I said, well, yeah, of course they're going to be really disappointed. Um, and well, why can't they join? It's like, oh, well, it will require treaty change. Oh, it's a bureaucracy. And you just think Europe is so in need of this kind of emotive, like foundational myth. And it's got one. I mean, the, I think most people have been very inspired. Uh, many people in the West have been very inspired by the Ukrainians. They have this emotive myth. It's there. The Ukrainians want to join. And for them to just turn around and say, well, we have these sausage regulations and I'm afraid that your kolbasa doesn't meet them... Just in, feels, in terms of doing yeah. things quickly, as a, as a former Istanbul correspondent, I'd like to point out that I think the Ankara first, the first agreement on potential uh, Turkish membership was signed, I think, in 1962. So it, okay. th these things can take time. Ukraine's a very different case, um, but uh, there's, there are clearly obstacles in its path. Um, Kerry, any, any thoughts on what's being done well, what's being um, done badly in the West? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think... It's, it's been heartening that there has been... I think the West has done what it can do. But the, the brute reality is, A, um, the potency of the West as an economic kind of block with its sanctioning power is declining by the year, right? I mean, it's declining by the day. Um, so that is a blunt instrument that I think is not going to have any leverage against... I mean, if we want to sanction China for some reason, go, you know, go dream with the birds. I mean, that's just going to be a big joke. Um, so I think this sort of, you know, habit of sanctioning people is sort of symbolically quite satisfying, maybe psychologically quite satisfying, but it's not going to... I mean, it's, it's got, a, got limited um, effectiveness. I don't know. If I think three or four years into the future, um, well, whatever happens, we have the brute reality of a Russia which is very resentful. Whether Putin goes or, you know, whether, whether he goes or he stays, I mean, it's... It's still going to even, I mean, I presume, I don't know, but I presume as a Russian, whatever your view of Putin, you don't want to be defeated in a humiliating way. Even if you, you want an exit, maybe. I think that's what China's trying to do. But you don't want an exit where the West can crow about, yay, we won again, you know? And I think, I guess I, um, and it's not a popular view, but I, I really find this sort of, we're in this fight for democracy, we're in this fight for values. Well, are we? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it's an unjust and appalling thing and the principle of it's not right for you to invade someone else. Yep, I get that. But the idea that you're on some sort of higher crusade, um, which some American and British politicians sign up to, sounds about 100 years out of date. And I don't think that language helps anymore. I'm not sure the Iraq war was that long ago, but, <laughs> but, but I, I, I tell you, but I mean... We never learn, huh? Well, um, what's, what's your thought on that? 
I really agree. I think that sanctions in particular, just the language of sanctions, I think I've already mentioned, I dislike, and this idea that, oh, it's autocracy versus democracy. I mean, in particular, to go back to the European context, it was hilarious to see how Poland overnight went from, oh, this troubling country that was limiting the rights of women, um, you know, to exercise freedom over their own bodies to, oh, look, they're the biggest freedom fighter. Yay. I mean, it's just, just because something's in our interest doesn't mean it's necessarily morally good, which is why it's, I mean, there is a morality about the Ukraine, about, the, about Russia's war on Ukraine. I think um, I've probably made it quite clear where I see that line, but it's, it's just, I find it just very depressing the way that this moralizing talk always gets brought in, because if we cared that much about morality, we probably wouldn't have any dealings with Saudi Arabia, um, you know, which might or might not be a good thing. It's not my place to judge, but yes, just, just to sort of come up on that. But, but in, can, in, oh, sorry, in terms of the moving parts, sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> well, I, 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 and, <laughs> I got distracted and, and to, about... to, to, to add to the yeah. moving parts, can yeah, you, to, 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 parts. Be, to be specific, can you see a, a situation in four or five years' time mm -hmm. where all of Ukrainian territory in the Donbass and Crimea is back in Ukrainian hands? Because that would constitute mm. a, a, a Russian defeat. Why should Ukraine not say this is what we want, and yet are we going to get anywhere near to that? I mean, Ukraine should say that's what they want, and I think that's what a lot of the Ukrainian population want, certainly if we look at, at surveys. I personally don't think that that is likely to happen um, for lots of different reasons, um, but I think if we just stay on the, the moving parts, my big worry, as somebody who wants Ukraine to regain as much of it, its people, um, because it's people who live on territory, um, as possible, is that next year we have a huge election year, uh, there are elections in the U.S. There, there, there are elections when Russia. If we can well, elections. Um, obviously, we'll probably have elections here, and I do think that within the, the next six months are crucial in terms of what any longer-term situation in three or four years will look like. I think that Ukraine's success um, on the battlefield right now um, and in the next six months. I think they're going to need that in order to convince the West to continue supporting, in order to keep that momentum up. And I say that sadly because I think that the West should support Ukraine fully, but just talking about you know being realistic. Um, so that's that's my big big worry. And I think already we're starting to see this. Oh, should we take some sanctions off? I, I really worry that we're gonna the West is gonna miss an opportunity um, to to focus on its own resilience um, and some of its own problems. And to, and to help Ukraine, and I, I'm just very worried it will, you know, sort of ebb out, peter out. I mean, it's interesting, one of the points about sanctions is that, uh, unlike, for example, the sanctions against, Western sanctions against Iran, which are secondary sanctions, so other people get penalised for dealing with Iran, whereas the sanctions against, Iraq, against Russia are actually more light touch than that, which is perhaps one of the reasons why they haven't worked so well. I mean, within Russia, presumably, there was some nervousness to begin with, when the West said, right, we're going to sanction you, we're going to do this, we're going to stop the banky, you're not going to be you use your credit card, McDonald's is leaving. But it hasn't been as bad as, as certainly people in, I, th I think officials in the West thought it would be, or perhaps as people in Russia feared. Uh, has that been part of the kind of the, the ambivalent mood in Russia? Uh, true. Uh, when the war started and sanctions, uh, and the West implemented the sanctions, everybody was frightened in Moscow and people, uh, my friends, they bought a lot of perfumes and <laughs> Western, and luxury Western goods. Uh, but uh, uh, six, I, I even I, I remember that I sent, I bought a lot of uh, a lot of spaghetti and sauce and sent it to my uh, my auntie who who is living alone in Russian province because I was afraid she will be starving. But nothing of that happened. Nothing. And I asked my friends in Moscow. Uh, do you feel a lack of something right now uh, in in the city? And they thought, mm, no, we don't have French and and and, and 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 Swiss cheese, but we didn't have it many years ago because of sanctions we implemented before the war. And uh, prices on luxury goods are quite high, but we still can buy this. Uh, there are a lot of food produced inside the country, and they are quite good, uh, even cheese. And so. A parallel import of consumers' goods are, are on a huge scale, and uh, the, the uh, shops are, are, f are full of goods in Moscow. So there is no, uh, there is right now everybody is calm about that. And banking system, it is. I mean, uh, of course you you experience a lot of difficulties if you go abroad, 
but in in the country, it's ever, uh, the banking system is operating very well, and there is no problem inside the country, even uh, even after the SWIFT was was SWIFT off. So, I don't know. In terms of uh, in terms of in industry and equipments and uh, technologies, it might be a problem. Right now, they are somehow to adjust. The, the economy somehow adjusts to what's going on, but in future it will be a huge problem with chips, with uh, equipment for, with equipments for internet service providers, for telecommunications, and we saw signs that uh, speed of the internet started slowing down in Russian provinces, but in Moscow it's still okay. And it seems that um, Putin's economy is doing quite well, and people, uh, and his economists and people who are uh, who are working in the Ministry of Economy, they are quite good. They are still, he inherited them from the from the last time from Yeltsin. They are all so-called liberals, not real liberals, but they are, and they are, they are doing a good job for him. Okay, well, we've got about eight minutes left because I'm told we have to finish strictly on time. Um, is, is any other questions? Uh, yes, one here, uh, and if you could do this one, and I will do this one. Uh, Kerry, question for you. Um, <clears throat> in light of what's happened between Russia and Ukraine, thinking about China and Taiwan, what's the likely impact of this on China's disposition towards Taiwan, if any? And yes. Yes. Um, Hi, my name is Bianca, and I work in investment facilitation covering Eastern Europe, um, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia being some of the countries I work in. Um, and I'm actually interested in the issue of language, or maybe not an issue, but uh, I'm curious, uh, what do you think of uh, Russian's language legacy will be uh, due to this war? And I'm asking this because uh, spent, I have spent some time in Ukraine and Moldova, and feels like, um, you know, maybe 50-50 uh, the country is split in like 50% speak Russian, 50% speak the other language. Whereas in Georgia, it felt like maybe more uh, split towards uh, the older generation speaking more Russian and the younger generation speaking Georgian. Uh, and also, I'm asking this because read, um, you know, as the war kicked off in Ukraine, a lot of people who knew Russian, maybe Westerners, um, they wanted to pick up Ukrainian. Uh, more like a, you know, showing sign of support, whereas others were thinking that actually this is a good opportunity to start learning, learning Russian and to understand better, like, what Russia is doing. So I'm okay. kind of curious, like, okay. what your uh, thoughts on language? Okay, thank you. Um, Kerry, do you want to go first on, on Taiwan? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it's, um, it's a very different case. So um, the Chinese um, would not think of... Russia, Ukraine as being um, particularly applicable, uh, firstly because um, it would be an amphibious attack uh, if, if, if there were an attack, that's, that's obviously very different. Secondly, because um, as realists, I think China may have looked at the war uh, that's going on and said, okay, it's gonna need us to be much, much clearer about what our strategic objective is. Um, they also are dealing with an entity which has de facto independence since 1949. So it's way, way tougher. Um, the only thing, which is rather terrifying actually, that might make the Chinese do something um, precipitate and sort of um, illogical is American politics. You just need one American politician who might have a chance of being president, which wouldn't be Trump or Biden, by the way, because they, re <laughs> believe it or not, been relatively calm on this. Um, if you have a candidate that wants to change American policy to the um, the one China, uh, the third time lucky on the microphone. <laughs> yes, I mean I'm really getting their attention tonight. Um, if you um, have an American politician who wants to uh, question that, and that's more likely now than it's ever been before. I mean, it's not that likely, but it's likely you cross the red line. And Xi Jinping is not in control of this policy, right? He cannot change this policy. The all-powerful Xi Jinping has to stick by the reunification narrative. 
And if America contests that, well, okay, we have a problem. And just finally on that, this would not be, Russia-Ukraine is a horrible, you know, tragic situation, yeah. A war between China and Taiwan would be third world war because it would be alliances between America and China. It would be smashing apart the world's supply chains. Um, it would catastrophically impact on semiconductors because 85% of the world's semiconductors are high tech are made in one factory in Taiwan. Um, it would have an implosive impact on, you know, geopolitics everywhere. It would be a catastrophe. But I tell you, if China is pushed to that red line, it will go over it. I mean, it will. So we shouldn't play around with this issue. Yeah, sobering thought. Um, so uh, back to the, 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 the question about Russian language, where I guess in some ways is a question about um, the idea of, of a Russian sphere of influence and a Russian world, and is that world getting bigger or smaller, which I suppose also comes back to, you know, what is Vladimir Putin trying to achieve? Is he trying to re recreate a Soviet Union and that, what all that means about a, a Russian sphere of influence? I think, um, I know a lot of people used to be a bit, in the West used to be a bit sneery about the idea that Russia had soft power, but it did. It had considerable soft power through sort of television, which having spent time in Central Asia, I have to say Russian television is just a lot better. Just the, the quality of the, of, of the soaps or, or whatnot is, is better than, than, than Kyrgyz ones because of the money. Um, so, but Russia did have considerable soft power and obviously this war has had a big impact on it. I mean, I can't wait for the archives to be open so we can see what the Central Asian countries have been sending to Ukraine and which ones have been sending what, because I think quite a lot will come out. Um, but if we speak specifically about sort of Russian as a, as I think your question as well was pointing at Russian almost as an identity marker, um, particularly in the case of Moldova, Transnistria, and, and of course in Ukraine. And um, there have been a lot of cases, including a lot of my own um, Russian speaking Ukrainian friends who, who have now switched um, to Ukrainian. A lot of people made that switch in 2014, um, to be honest, particularly among sort of younger population. Um, but then they still spoke Russian, you know, with, with certain people. And uh, Ukraine is very bilingual. It's kind of hard to, to exp explain it properly. Um, you know, it's not like if, if, if we all had to learn Welsh or if English people all had to learn Welsh or Gaelic. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot more uh, closeness between the languages, so they are very much different languages. There's a lot more there's a lot more closeness, but um, but some people will continue to speak Russian, um, even even in Ukraine, and and it comes down to questions of identity that that we don't have time to discuss now. Uh, Irina, last word to you. Okay. You have about a I minute. I think that uh, the future of Russian language in Ukraine is very gloomy because my my father he came from Odessa region and. Uh, Many relatives, my my relatives live in Odessa and Odessa region, and uh, the speaking language of Odessa always was Russian, because there are uh, everybody lives there, uh, Jews uh, live there, Greeks, Russians, and uh, and even ethnic minorities like my father, he's Gagauz, and so I'm half Gagauzian, and they all speak Russians. And my cousins told me a few months ago that people younger, who my cousins, she lives in Odessa, that. She told me that uh, people younger than 35, they just stop speaking, stop to speak Russian outside home. It's very difficult for them to speak Ukrainian because they just start to pick up the language, but they try and they just refuse to do this publicly. For all the generations, it's a little bit harder, but it is a sign that a Russian language is not welcomed even in Odessa. Well, it's a fascinating point to end on. We range across a very wide uh, area of, of, of expertise. So just uh, finally say thank you very much to our panel, to Kerry, to Jade and to Irina. Thank you very much.